About six months ago, I built a DIY NAS with an eight core 16 thread processor, 128 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC memory, 10 three and a half inch and six two and a half inch hot swap bays, and it runs TrueNAS Community Edition, which most people know as TrueNAS Scale. In this video, I'll walk you through the entire process, what I learned, what I changed, and what you need to know before building your own or deciding to buy a pre-built NAS device. Because trust me, some of these lessons were learned the hard way. So the first question to answer is why I built a DIY NAS. I've always used pre-built NAS devices and intended on buying a new Synology device when they were released, but quite honestly, I got tired of waiting. I started looking into alternatives and there were some great options out there, but all of them required me to conform to them, meaning I'd have to fit my requirements into what they were capable of rather than prioritizing what I need. From that point forward, it was clear that if I wanted a NAS device that was tailored to my requirements, I had to build it, so I did. The hardware I selected was a Ryzen 5700X CPU, 128 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC memory, two 25 gig NICs, an HBA card for the drives, and even an NVIDIA RTX 3060 GPU for some local AI. The three and a half inch drive bays are used for most of the storage and the two and a half inch SSD slots are reserved for either shared storage with Proxmox or a pool dedicated to video editing or both. That is the power of DIY. After the hardware was selected, I downloaded TrueNAS Scale at the time, which is now TrueNAS Community Edition, installed it, set up my ZFS pool, and I was ready to go. I had a blank NAS device ready to go and I was lost. I spent so much time planning out the hardware and ensuring it would all work properly together, then comparing TrueNAS Scale and Unraid for the operating system based on my needs, that I completely missed everything after that. This is really the first lesson because with a pre-built NAS device, you don't have to do any of this. You buy a NAS device, it comes with a first party NAS operating system installed and you start configuring it. So this led to a lot of questions. Which VDEV layout did I want to use? How did I want to get the data over to the NAS? How was I going to replace the applications that I used? What was the best data structure I should use since I wasn't super happy with how it was set up? These were the questions that I didn't have answers to. Since my initial plan was to go from a Synology NAS to a Synology NAS, I would either migrate the drives or do a backup and restore from the old system to the new system. With a new NAS operating system, those options didn't exist. So the next lesson is that you need to have a setup strategy and a migration strategy. It's not like I didn't know what my options were, I just didn't think about it. After spending some time mulling it over, creating my Z pool, not being happy with the performance, then recreating it, I created two RAID Z1 VDEVs with three drives each. This gave me a happy medium between performance and redundancy since ZFS works differently than traditional RAID. After the pool was created, I used rsync to move all the data that I wanted from the old NAS to the new NAS after settling on the data sets that I wanted to use, which is lesson number three. Think through your data structure. It doesn't matter what NAS operating system that you plan on using, you need a solid data structure, and that might differ from NAS operating system to NAS operating system. For example, in Synology DSM, you take snapshots of an entire shared folder. You can't create subfolders that have a different snapshot schedule than the top level shared folder. So your data structure is generally based on permissions, snapshots, and backups. Compare that to something like TrueNAS, where you could have nested data sets that have different permissions, snapshot, and backup schedules than its parent. For this reason, you can really consolidate your data with TrueNAS better than you can with Synology DSM. So that's the next lesson. Don't do today what you did yesterday because that's how it's always been. Think it through because you might be able to better manage your data with a new operating system than you were able to with your old operating system. After my data sets were created, I needed to figure out how I was going to access my data. This is gonna sound absolutely crazy, but I almost never used SMB to access my data on my Synology NAS. The only time I did was when I was accessing infrequent data, but for data I was accessing daily, I used Synology Drive with on-demand sync. 
This allowed me to sync data back and forth to my NAS and ensure it gets backed up without really having to do anything. How was I going to replace that functionality? This is when I hit my first roadblock because I still haven't found a solution. I started using SyncThing, which works very well, but the data lives on all devices with SyncThing. So if I have one terabyte of files, it will take one terabyte on every device that I sync that data to. With Synology Drive, that's not the case because of on-demand sync, which is the next lesson. When you rely on first-party applications, switching from that operating system means you lose access to that first-party application. In certain cases, I was able to replace them like using your backup instead of Synology's Active Backup for Business for my device backups, which I did a video on if you're interested. But in other cases, like with Synology Drive, I haven't been super happy with any of the alternatives and there is a chance that I just won't have that functionality moving forward. So while that in specific isn't the best, there are some legitimate bright sides to this. I started using great third-party applications like SyncThing, Your Backup, and more in my daily workflow. I have a better data structure than I did because TrueNAS and its data sets allowed me to structure my data better with better snapshot and backup schedules than I had with Synology DSM. This provides a cleaner experience, not necessarily better because I have the same functionality that I did, but the data itself is stored in a more logical way, which then leads to the next point, which is that a NAS is a NAS. I'm not doing anything drastically differently than I did. I interact with the data, I run a few services on the NAS, it takes snapshots, and it backs up my data. The core functionality, in the end, is very similar to what it was, it's just a different platform. A platform that has a lot more flexibility than I had, but that's more on the hardware side than the software side. And that, after all of this, is the key. The hardware is more powerful than most pre-built NAS devices, and that, paired with the case, allows me to run a larger storage pool than I could with a pre-built NAS device. But in the end, was it worth it? Should I have bought something like an 8-bay Ugrain NAS device and just installed TrueNAS on it? Would I have had a better experience? Would it have been the same? Here's what I think. If you're someone who wants granular controls over your hardware choices, there's nothing out there that can beat a DIY NAS. You can find a motherboard and CPU combo that will have all the power and PCIe lanes that you want, support ECC memory, and do just about everything. But there's going to be some sort of assembly required and then the operating system installation. This will give you a lot of future flexibility from a hardware perspective. I mean, I have 10 three and a half inch and six two and a half inch hot swap drive bays that I probably never have with a pre-built NAS. And managing all of that with TrueNAS has been great. And that completely ignores the fact that if I wanted to, I could add six more two and a half inch hot swap drive bays. But again, you can install a third party OS on a pre-built NAS device. So those hardware changes are the key. You don't need a DIY NAS to run TrueNAS. So the biggest question is, do you want control over your hardware? And are you willing to plan it all out and build it out to have that control. You can do just about everything I'm doing right now with a pre-built NAS device that runs TrueNAS, though there is generally some sort of disassembly required to get to the boot drive so that you can install your own OS, unless you're willing to overwrite the existing NAS operating system, which most people won't do, but you can do it if you want. Even in some cases, like with the LinkStation S1, there's a very easy USB key that you can get to and you can install your own OS that way. So every pre-built device is going to be different. It's then the same process to install the operating system, but it removes a huge piece of the puzzle and it's not having to select compatible hardware. You're going to give up some customization to not have to worry about finding parts that all work together and are energy efficient because I promise you, there are a lot of comparisons you're gonna to have to make. So for that reason, the operating system cancels itself out and you're left purely comparing hardware. Do you want flexibility with the exact hardware specs you want? Or do you want hardware that's guaranteed to work that is less customizable? That is the deciding factor between a DIY NAS and a pre-built NAS. 
If both of those options sound bad to you, you might just want a pre-built NAS that can run a first party NAS operating system. And there's nothing wrong with that. Overall, you're gonna have generally the same functionality that I have after spending all of this time planning, building, and customizing the NAS without any of the headache. Because again, a NAS is generally a NAS. It's not gonna be drastically different. So in the end, am I happy with my decision? After six months, yes. It's been a much slower transition than I initially expected, but a lot of that is from my unwillingness to give up Synology Drive. I had and still have a huge reliance on that system. And there's a chance that I will always have some sort of a small Synology device just to continue using that. But I'm working on that problem and feel like I'm gonna have a solution to it sooner than later. But with that said, Synology Drive is very, very difficult to replace if you are a Synology user. It is super, super powerful. It gives you a web interface to access your data. It's very easy to manage your documents. And overall, I was able to automate just about my entire workflow with it. So it cannot be understated how good of an application that is. And while there are third-party alternatives, I haven't personally found any of them that have been up to par with Synology Drive. Not that Synology Drive is perfect, but in my experience, it's been a little better. But again, I'm working on it. Other than that one problem, this is the most powerful NAS device I've ever owned. TrueNAS has been a great primary NAS operating system. I've replaced a bunch of first-party apps with great third-party apps, and it just works. Hopefully it stays this way, but that is my final lesson. Unless you're willing to go with enterprise hardware, you're going to be using consumer grade hardware. That's not necessarily a problem, but I'm not as confident in this system lasting me for 10 years as I am with my Synology lasting for that long. I have no basis to really say that, but pre-built manufacturers do stress tests with their devices in large batches to ensure system reliability in long-term usage. For me, the individual components were most likely stress tested, but not all of them working together. Does that mean that I'm gonna have problems? No, of course not. But it is something that you should keep in mind. So was it worth it for me? Yes. Is it worth it for you though? Not necessarily. You're gonna to have to determine that for yourself. If you wanna see a build log for my NAS, I'll leave that in the description. But other than that, if you guys have any questions, please leave those in the comments. And if you made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.